Bain & Company's Keith Bevins talks about jobs and life at Bain. Welcome to the 251st episode of Admission Straight Talk, except it's a podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. I'm Linda Abraham, the founder of Accepted and the host of this podcast. My mission and passion is to help you show that you both fit in at your target schools and are stand out in the applicant pool. The result, you get a message one day that causes you to jump up and down shouting, yes, I'm in, and not only in, but in at the best program for you. This podcast is brought to you by Accepted's Guide, Fitting In and Standing Out, a free guide available to Admission Straight Talk listeners. If you want to master the paradox at the heart of admissions, download the guide at accepted.com slash F-I-S-O, as in fit in, stand out. Again, that's accepted.com slash F-I-S-O. One of the biggest motivations, if not the biggest motivation, for applying to graduate school is career enhancement and achievement of your professional goals and dreams. For many MBAs and some other graduate students, consulting has irresistible appeal. Today, it is my distinct pleasure to have on Admission Straight Talk, Keith Bevins, partner and global head of consultant recruiting at Bain & Company. Keith earned his bachelor's and master's in engineering from MIT and an MBA from Harvard. Except for his two years at HBS, Keith has been with Bain since 1996, both as a client-facing consultant and most recently as head of global recruiting. Keith, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Hi, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Now, can you briefly outline the hiring process at Bain for consultant positions if one is coming from graduate business school or other graduate programs? Sure, and the process starts earlier than a lot of people might think because we really wanna make sure that students that are interested in consulting have, or even curious about consulting, have all the information at their fingertips. So a lot of times, We'll first engage with students as part of our Experience Bain programming, and that's a series of live and virtual events that happen typically the summer before they even arrive on campus at business school. And it gives them a sense of what we're about, what consulting is about, and what consultants actually do. Uh, When you're in your first year at most business schools, we're not allowed to talk to students uh, in the first sort of four to six weeks. So Mm -hmm. sometime in that late September, early October timeframe, we'll have sort of a large kickoff event And again, we'll introduce Bain, we'll introduce sort of what types of work we do, and we'll introduce them to um, different consultants, Uh, maybe look at experience with summer associates and hear about some of the projects, and they'll meet a lot of us uh, during that time. And then they'll go through the recruiting process sort of towards that October, November timeframe with interviews in January. That's how first year recruiting works when they get to campus. The same types of things happen for second year students. Um, although most of them will opt out of the summer events because they sort of know us from their first year. But right when they get back to school at the beginning of September, you know, the recruiting season starts with on-campus events and then interviews typically happen in the October timeframe and it's wrapped up by Thanksgiving of that second year. So they have lots of opportunities to get to know us um, and they can hit the ground running well-informed uh, by the information that's online and the information they'll see on their campuses. So if somebody gets in touch with you, let's say the summer before applying, before they start business school or two years before they graduate from another graduate program, are they really Mm -hmm. aiming for an internship in that summer or are they thinking about a full-time employment at the end of two years? Sometimes both. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of times what we'll find is, you know, those summer events that we do before they start, they're not really recruiting events as much Mm -hmm. as they're education events. Okay. I want students who... You know, recruit with us in the fall when they're on campus to know what they're recruiting for. And I'd say a good percentage of the students that engage with us the summer before they get to business school go, wow, that's really great. I really like what they do. I think it's really interesting, but that's actually not aligned with my career goal, uh-huh. which is awesome because then yeah. they can focus on, on areas that are better fit when they get to campus. Um, most of the time, the students that engage with us over the summer and engage with us when they get to campus are looking for that summer internship. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know, at Bain, about 90% of the people that come work with us for the summer um, get the offer in return at the end of their business school experience. So, you know, for us, the summer associate program, which is what we call our internship program, is a, uh, a very important on-ramp. Um, and it's a really great way for people who are interested in a career at Bain to sort of get their foot in the door and, and set themselves up nicely for that offer when they're done with business school. Okay. Now, I reviewed, I watched an excellent interview 
on your bio page on the on the Bain website, which we'll link to from our show notes at exhibit.com 251. And you outline there the four qualities Bain looks for in recruits. And those are problem solving ability, client facing mm-hmm. skills, teamwork, and certain personal characteristics, including humility and leadership. Can you unwrap those requirements a bit? Why are they important and where do you find them in the recruiting process? You know, the, the answer to that question starts with what we're about at Bain. It's okay. more about creating client success stories and people success stories. And people doesn't just mean, you know, our clients. It also means our, our people on our teams. And, and client success stories doesn't mean, again, just the executives, but it means the entire organization and the company itself. And we're hiring and we're looking for the type of people that want to have an impact with the work that they're doing. They're not coming in to just do a job. They're coming in to really make a difference. And so the characteristics that, that we talked about in that other, in that other discussion mm-hmm. are really the types of things that we believe are necessary to be successful on the job. Success is defined by creating client people successes. So let's unpack those a little bit. The problem solving ability is your ability to take sort of something that's really complicated. You know, we're working with, you know, some of the top companies and, and their most senior executives on the things that keep them up at night. These aren't easy problems that Bain consultants are getting asked to, to solve. But how do you break that down into discrete parts so that you can then prove or disprove a hypothesis on each one of those parts to come up with the overall answer for what they need to do next? But it's not enough to just be sort of smarter or more credentialed or just, you know, more self-confident than, than the people that you're working with. To be effective as a Bain consultant, you have to have the people skills that can inspire clients and, and present your analysis in a compelling way. Mm-hmm. You, know, you need those things to be successful, and that's some of the client skills uh, that we're looking for. You know, Bain consultants tend to work alongside our clients. We don't, we don't do it to our clients. We do it with our clients. Um, and we're looking for the types of people that can demonstrate sort of an inclination to work that way with the people, and we can see that in, in, in interviews. Um, and then the last part that you mentioned was teamwork. Mm-hmm. And that is because we really do work in teams at Bain. I know a lot of MBA students say, well, you know, we have project teams and I have a study group. I like teams too. But at Bain, you know, the most successful partners at the firm and the ones that stay around the longest are the ones that team the best. So if I'm working with a CEO on a strategy and she tells me we're going to have to make an acquisition at the end of this project, I'm actually better off if I go find somebody who's an M&A expert at Bain and bring them into the, into the project with me. Mm -hmm. because that will get a better answer for my client. And so when you're working at Bain and you're an entry-level consultant or a new associate consultant and you're looking up at the people that have been most successful, they're the people that team the best. And that feels very different, you know, when you're working alongside people who know that teaming is a necessary component of being successful at the firm. And so we look for that, uh, not just on the resume, but we look for how people engage and how they accept and receive coaching and feedback throughout throughout the interview process and the recruiting process. And that sort of ties to the last couple of things we talked about in that other discussion around humility and leadership, mm-hmm. which is just, you know, we're not we're not looking for people who can pound their chest or need to come into the room and say, you know, I'm the smartest person in here. We should all listen to me. We're looking for people who understand that they have a lot of experience. They have sort of the weight and expertise of Bain behind them. But they're also talking with clients a lot of times who may not have the same credentials. But man, that 20 years of experience working with that particular customer segment is critically important. And the people at Bain that are successful understand that my expertise and Bain's experience combined with your experience and your insight will get us both to a better place than either one of us would get to on our own. And so we're looking for all of those things in our interview and our recruiting process. Okay, great. Thank you. How does the recruiting process differ for MBAs and let's say from other graduate recruits, whether they be earning masters of management, which can be a one-year program, JDs, PhDs, or holders of masters in engineering like yourself or other master's degrees. Yeah, that's a great question. And we we get asked that a lot because as the market continues to evolve, we're seeing a lot of different types of degrees um, that are relevant, you know, master's of science and analytics or master's of finance programs and things like that that weren't, weren't really a thing when I was coming through the process. The truth is the processes themselves are quite similar, mm-hmm. um, especially when you're talking about some of the advanced degrees like JDs, doctorates, MDs, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, those are 
those are almost identical because a lot of times they're looking at coming in at the same level as an MBA hire. Mm -hmm. I would say what's a little bit different is that we will run specific types of events for PhDs. We have Advanced into Consulting, our AIC program, and the Advantage program. And both of those programs are either one day or, or sort of one week programs intended to expose um, that candidate pool to consulting into Bain. And so I might go to an MBA campus, like I'll go to my alma mater, and I can just talk about how Bain is different than other consulting firms because there's sort of a baseline understanding with all the former consultants running around on campus of what Bain does and, and what consulting is. You know, so I can sort of start with level two. You know, mm -hmm. what, how are we different? Mm -hmm. For a lot of PhD candidates, they're not as familiar with consulting. So we've set up a, an entire series of events that's geared towards giving them some of that baseline understanding on the industry. And then we talk a little bit about Bain. So it starts a little bit further upstream, but the process themselves are quite similar. Um, the other thing that you mentioned is those other master's programs, uh, you know, the MFIN, Master of Science Analytics, et cetera, or my master's of engineering. You know, we do look at each individual application you know, on the merits of, of, of the individual application. And so someone like myself who had a master's but didn't work, I went straight through for five years and got my master's degree, you know, I would come in at one place. But someone could get that same degree but have worked for three or four years, and we would view them differently. And so my, my sort of encouragement to students is if they think they're a good fit for Bain um, and they have the skill set and we're a good fit for what their professional goals are, they should go ahead and apply and we'll work with them to figure out what the right entry point is. But the processes are, are nearly identical every step of the way. And let's say somebody comes, well, you, you came from engineering. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe somebody comes from, I don't know, Asian studies or medicine. Do you, yeah. would you train them if, for two really different fields? Would you tr provide business training? That's a, that's a really good question. You know, one of the things that I tell people, because they, they sort of assume that everybody who comes into, you know, consulting or comes into Bain, you know, I might have been an engineer, but if you look at my transcript, you'll see business classes all over it. That was absolutely not the case. I didn't take any econ classes. I didn't take any finance classes. Every single one of my internships right up through my grad school year, I had seven by the time I graduated, um, every single one of them was technical and there was engineering focused. Mm -hmm. um, what I was learning, though, was I was learning problem solving skills mm -hmm. and, and I was learning how to do analytics. I was learning how to work with different types of people. I was learning sort of the fundamental skills that I needed to be successful as a consultant. But what I didn't know was you know, how to read a balance sheet, how to read an income statement. I didn't know some of the strategy tools that we use. When you join Bain & Company at every level, you'll go through about a week of training in the office to learn some of the basics, the basic toolkit. You know, you'll learn how to learn, you'll learn how to use Excel, which for me, having been an engineer, that was okay. I knew how to use Excel. What I didn't know was, like I said, how to do accounting. Yeah. But the accountant may not have known how to use some of the tools that I knew how to use. So everybody gets that baseline understanding and that baseline training for about a week. And then depending on whether you're an undergrad hire or an MBA hire, you'll work for a couple of months and then you'll go to a global training program. And we'll pull together sort of your entire starting class from around the world. And you'll be put in a group of people of four to six with a trainer who's actually on the Bain leadership team. And over the course of a week, you'll work through uh, how we think about analytics, how we think about working with clients, how we manage our teams. What's really neat is you get that experience at Bain plus or minus every 18 months throughout your entire career. So as you need to learn new skills, you know, you're getting trained just in time, in addition to all the online tools that we have internally, the Bain Virtual University, in-office trainings and things like that. It also is a pretty neat way to build out your network because you can imagine uh, our summer associates go through a global training program in Cape Cod, and mm -hmm. then they'll start at Bain, you know, a year and a half later. And guess what? That same group of first years, many of whom met each other as summer associates, will be back together for global training. And then 18 months later, they'll get back together again for global training. And you really start building friendships and relationships globally because we are a global firm with you know, offices, 55 offices around the world. Um, and so it's really neat. But you get that. We know that not everybody comes in with the same starting point. So what we're looking for are those raw materials. And we'll teach you how to sort of turn them into something great. Speaking of raw, raw materials, is there is there a way for... Um a young professional or a graduate student to kind of prepare themselves. Let's say, you know, somebody's working as an engineer or working as a, a programmer. 
and they say, you know, I, I really want to, to branch out. Um, and, and I think I'd like to go into mm-hmm. consulting and I, and they particularly uh, find Bain appealing. What can, um, a young professional or graduate student or even a college student do to prepare themselves for a career in consulting? And I don't just mean good grades and, and test scores now. I'm, I'm talking sure. qualitatively. Sure. You know, there's a couple of things. Um, and and I'll, I'll sort of answer your question and also throw in some things that I think don't don't work or aren't particularly effective. Okay. Um, you know, one, I think there is, there, it is important to focus on, on experience and focus on what you're doing and have a vision for your career. Um, you know, have an idea of what it is you see yourself doing 10, 15 years down the line. That doesn't mean that it's this specific job in this specific industry, but have some sense of the things that you like doing and some things, uh, some sense of the things you don't like doing, uh, because that helps you understand where consulting and where Bain might fit into that overall career goal. Um, and, and I think that's important. Now, when students are on campus, you know, I don't think it's particularly helpful to say, you know, I think I want to do consulting, so I'm going to take these classes or that class. As I said, you know, I didn't, I knew I wanted to do consulting relatively early on, but I didn't go and immediately start taking finance and econ classes. I figured I'll just keep focusing on my problem solving and my overall sort of college experience, and I'll, I'll learn the skills that I need to learn when, when I get there. I've heard a lot about Bain's training. I'm just going to trust it. Um, mm-hmm. I think the other thing that people should focus on is doing their jobs if they're working. So let's talk about that group for a second. Okay. Doing their jobs in a way so that they have an impact, right? I read a lot of resumes and people will sort of list what they did on their job, totally independent of any evidence to suggest they were good at their job. Right. You know, so they'll say they prepared reports for this and they analyzed that and they recommended this. And there's no indication that their analytics or their recommendation led to a 5% efficiency improvement or, you know, several million dollars sort of profit improvement. It just sort of says they did stuff. They basically now, described their responsibilities. Exactly. That's exactly right. And what's interesting about that is back to what I said Bain is all about. We're all about creating client success stories. And I can read somebody's resume and see if they're sort of results oriented by how they talk about the work that they did on their resume. And those people who just list out what they did from nine to five when they came in versus those people who sort of say, this is what I did, you know, over several months and this is why it mattered and this is why it was really great and this is why you should care. Those are the people that stand out to us. And so I would encourage people, now I'll answer your question directly. I would encourage people to think about the types of experiences they're having, the types of exposure they're getting and what they're learning and how they're growing as business leaders, because ultimately that's what's going to help them be successful at Bain and frankly beyond Bain. Um, the other thing that they should do a little more tactically is really get to know the different types of consulting firms that are out there. We're a corporate strategy consulting firm. We are doing work across every major sector of the economy. We're doing everything from strategy to org work to IT work. We're worried about what our clients are worried about and our clients are the leaders of those companies. There are other consulting firms out there that focus on specific parts of the value chain. Uh, jargon aside, they might focus on Salesforce effectiveness. They might mm-hmm. focus on IT or manufacturing. You can have great careers in those fields as well. But if you know you're super passionate about IT, there are places you can go and do just IT. That's not us. Mm-hmm. And so understanding the differences between not just the firms that do strategy consulting, but the different types of consulting that are out there is hugely valuable and, and frankly, time saving for your students. What is not helpful uh, to, to round out sort of Your question. What is not helpful is to say, you know, I tend to get bored on my internships. So I think I I think, you know, mixing up projects every couple of weeks or every couple of months, that's probably the type of career that I need. You know, I I really don't know what I want to do long term. So people think I should just do consulting because I can see a lot of stuff. Turns out that's not a super compelling argument. You know, I don't know what I want to do. So I want to be with you guys. I want to default. Um, Yeah, I'll default to you. I, I want to default. Yeah, I just want to stall my grown-up decision-making for another couple of years and work with Bain. That's, well, that's usually going to graduate school. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. That was a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, of course. Can you tell me a little bit more about the internship experience at, at Bain, either for MBAs yeah. or, or non-MBAs? Can you go? I know you touched on it a, a little bit ago, but can you go into mm-hmm. a little bit more detail? Yeah, sure. So the, our, our big, we have two big summer internship programs. One is the associate consultant program, which is our internship for sort of college juniors, if you will, before their senior year. And then we have the MBA internship, which we call the summer associate program. And that tends to be 
in between the, the two years of a two-year business school program. Mm-hmm. Um, let me just focus on the MBA one. The ACI one is very similar. Um, but the MBA program is a 10-week program. Uh, typically, on most of our campuses, there's some that are, are one-year programs like INSEAD um, or Kellogg has a one-year program. But typically, what you'll see is that sometime in the October timeframe, we'll host a kickoff event, and then there'll be a lot of industry presentations and chances for them to get to meet us and get to know us with an application uh, do sometime in like that December time frame, and then we'll do interviews in January and um, and sort of wrap up the recruiting process in February. The program itself, 10 weeks, starts with one week of training, uh, a couple days in the office, and then, like I said, a, a global training program out in, and right now we're running it in Cape Cod with all of our summer associates from all of our offices around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the next nine weeks, you're actually on a real project. Uh, we're not big on made-for-TV moments at Bain. Uh, I have more work a lot of times than I have people. And when I have the opportunity to have a, a, a talented MBA come in and join my team for, for what turns out to be about nine weeks of work, I plug them right in. I, I give them real projects. I put them in front of real clients and I expect them to have a real impact. Uh, one of the things that happens in that last, the 10th and final week is um, they do a presentation uh, to their leadership team and other, other leaders in the office. And I tend to sit in on all of the summer associate presentations in Chicago. And I am consistently blown away uh, by the impact that they're having on their clients in, in basically nine short weeks of work, you know, one year into their MBA program. Uh, you know, so that the program is actually more than just sort of, you know, we're not just having people play consultant for nine weeks or 10 weeks. We're, we're plugging them in and they're doing real work. It's, it's actually amazing to see um, how quickly they get, they get down the learning curve and start making a difference. What percentage of interns get full-time offers? Yes. Yeah, so our goal um, is to be very selective on the front end. Uh, so when we're going through that interview process, we are really looking for the best of the best. Um, mm-hmm. Our goal is to give offers to every single one of our summer associates. We typically come in around 90 percent. Oh, wow. Um, and, and an overwhelming majority of the people that get offers accept those offers and join us full time. Uh, you know, it is a it is a great way for them to get to know us. Sure. And it is a great way for us to get to see what they can do. Frankly, sort of every summer associate that I hire, you know, is 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 one less person I need to hire in full time for second year. But the way it practically works out um, is we end up doing a lot of second year recruiting as well. Um, Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is uh, we just looked at the chart. But over the last 23 years, we've grown on average 14 or 15 percent a year. And so I can hire as many summer associates as I can find. This is the fifth year in a row we've had our largest program ever. And we haven't, that, that 90% hasn't changed much. And Bain and Company is always looking for more people in the second year because our business has been uh, very successful and growing quite strong in, in all markets around the world. So it's actually a, a pretty tough, it's a pretty nice problem to have. That's true. That's true. Is the GMAT or GRE or LSAT or any alphabet soup of aptitude test used as a screening tool before and being invited to interview at Bain? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a good question. We, we do look at the GMAT score. We ask mm-hmm. for the standardized test scores with the application. Um, there's not a minimum that we're looking for, but we do have a sense of, of what a strong score is. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we do ask to see that. Um, the truth is that most of the students in, in the MBA programs already have the GMAT score anyway, and their, their schools are oftentimes telling them to put that on their resume. Mm-hmm. Um, we do get a, a fair amount of applications from people who took the GRE like I did um, and the LSAT. And there are conversion tools online, so we can sort of take your GRE score and convert that to an equivalent GMAT. Uh, but if you're in a sort of a JD program or MD program, or you're in another graduate program where you didn't have to take the GMAT, you don't have to take the GMAT to apply to Bain. We can work with the standardized test scores you have. All right. Is the, is the GPA used as a, as a screening tool before interviewing? You know, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question, too. At the MBA level, um, frankly, most schools don't don't let us ask about the grades mm-hmm. um, and so we don't we don't typically look at them for most business school students in fact i don't i can't think of any school that actually encourages students to put it on their resume we typically don't ask for for business school transcripts mm-hmm. at the undergraduate level we do ask for a gpa and uh, and their transcripts when they're applying for the associate consultant position um, 
But for MBAs, we're not asking them for their undergraduate GPAs. As I like to think about it, sort of business school becomes the Noah's Ark event. It's sort of a fresh start. If they were good (laughs) enough to get into a top business school, I'm not sure I'm going to question what their undergraduate experience was. You know, somehow they put it together and insert top business school here, thought they were good enough. And that's oftentimes good enough for us as well. Okay, great. If one is lucky enough to be invited to an interview at Bain, how should uh, Bain want to be prepared for the interview? Yeah, so there's a lot of ways that it, it's always fascinating to me because we didn't have a lot of the online tools that students have today. You know, we, we had a book and you could read the book. And once you read the book, it was time to interview. How quick. Um, and exactly, exactly. <laughs> and how, how easy it was back then. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, always, I'm always fascinated when I look online and I see some of the things that people are doing to prepare. And, and the first thing I think people need to understand is it, it's a process and it takes time. The, the biggest thing you need to do to prepare up front is understand what consulting is, how the firms are different, and why you want to do it. You know, this, the process is not an easy process, and it is very difficult um, to sort of fake it and, and, and pretend you want to do it when you really don't know what you're going after, because it's, it's a pretty demanding process. Um, now, the way to do it is, is generally, um, you, know, you have to prepare for case interviews. That's a big part of the process for us, and it's a big part of the process for most consulting firms. What I think is is different is that there's a bunch of students, I think, who try and cram and they, they get advice like you should be doing, you know, 10 to 15 cases a week for you know several months so that by the time you're ready, you know, you've, you've done your 60 or 70 cases and you're ready to enter. That's way too much. Now, first of all, you should be in school. You're a student. And second of all, it is about taking the time to reflect, not just rapid fire sort of you know, blowing through as many cases as possible. What I tell a lot of people is um, there's a group of guys in my section in business school. They were all former military and they all wanted to do consulting uh, after, after business school. And what they ended up doing was they would get together every Saturday morning for breakfast, um, the four of them. One would give a case, one would receive while the other two ate. And then the two that were eating, one would give a case, the other would receive while the first two ate. And then they'd shake hands and catch up again next weekend. And they started doing that pretty much when we got to school, like late September, early October. Come January, they all got consulting offers. That's the approach students should be taking. It's a slow and steady process of sort of going through some case prep, thinking about it, being a student, relaxing mentally, and picking it up again next week. The idea that you would sort of cram through you know, five cases a day during your winter break to get ready for January interviews, that tends not to work. Sounds like cramming um, for tests. It, it, exactly, which also didn't really work for me in undergrad either. No, um, and the other thing that I think students should keep in mind is you have to understand how to use the frameworks. You shouldn't sort of shoehorn any question, you know, shoehorn your framework into whatever question I ask you. So, you know, you've decided that you're, you're going to remember that, you know, revenue minus cost equals profit and, you know, fixed cost versus variable cost is, you know, total cost. And no matter what I ask you, you're just going to spit that out. <laughs> that tends not to work. Uh, it works for the sort of the Sunday morning talking head shows with the politicians. But in this case, I'm actually asking you a question. I'd like you to answer my question. Um, and so my advice to students is be familiar with the frameworks, be familiar with how to apply them. But it's not sort of a pattern matching game of I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to tell me Porter's five forces. And then I'm going to be like, wow, this person should be a consultant. That's, <laughs> that's not how it works. Um, and, and I, unfortunately, I think a lot of students feel that way. And, and to be honest, I think nerves play a factor in that. You, know, you get nervous and you just want to say it before you forget it. And that's OK. But we're really just going to have a business conversation in the interviews. And you should prepare, you know, by, by knowing your stuff and being confident, relaxed and well rested uh, so that we can just talk like two business people. OK. I also read that sometimes there, you know, there are so many different frameworks and, you, and the applicants would try and memorize the different frameworks and then try and, like you say, fit the question into, well, which framework is this really for? And, you know. Um, exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. All right. Now, Business Insider recently named Bain as the best place to work in 2017. Glassdoor uh, said it's the second best place to work. And these aren't Bain's only honors and accolades as an employer. What is Bain doing right that makes it such a great place to work? And obviously, you've, this is the only place you've worked since graduating college, right? Yes, but I did work for four different companies as an intern while I was in college. Okay. I got to see a bunch of different things. I've also seen um, over my 22 years at Bain a lot of different clients too. I'm so sure. I've actually been in five more companies than most people. 
Um, you know, it is interesting. Uh, I'm certainly biased given my role, but I, I do say that it starts with hiring sort of really smart, really passionate people that want to make a difference. And it's not just making a difference in clients, not making a difference in their social lives or whatever, but it's it's they want to positively impact all the communities they're a part of. And, and when you're spending as much time as you spend at work, um, you know, consulting is a consulting is a big part of, um, of of your life. And it's a big part of the community that you are um, that you're you know, you, you want to improve. So it does start with hiring great people on the front end. The, the second thing that I would say is that you know, our leadership is really committed to to being a great place to work. And, and our view is that leadership really creates the atmosphere so that great ideas have an opportunity to be heard, implemented, and thrive. And that is a big part of how we approach things. So a lot of the innovations that we're doing to be the best place to work, whether it's you know, office social events or different trainings or different experience sharing sessions or people want to learn about you know, blockchain or whatever, whatever the cool buzzwords are in the news today, you know, our leadership has set up a culture where people can sort of say, you know what, I want to do a brown bag lunch on this. Is that cool? And everybody goes, sure, let's do it. You know, let's talk about different issues. And and so it's not just that our leadership is supportive. They're vocally supportive. They're actively supportive of those types of innovations coming from our people. And then the last thing I think is, is it's just we do really great work, you know, and, and, and you know, it, like they say in a lot of sports teams, you know, winning tends to, to fix a lot of other issues. You know, we're fixing the issues regardless. But people want to be a part of an organization that is truly making a difference. Like, you, know, you read the newspaper and you see the headlines of this company did this and this company did that. And you know that your main colleagues were the people doing the work behind those headlines. That's amazing. That is ridiculously energizing for our people. And that's a big part of it. And so those three things come together really nicely. I think, you know, we, we hire great people there. They have great leaders in place that, that let those people sort of spread their wings and thrive. And together, we just we do, we get really great results for our clients. And those, those come together in a really nice way. And it, I've hear more and more about work life balance. And when I was on your site preparing for today's call, I also, you know, saw that mentioned on the site. What does mm -hmm. that mean? What does that mean at Bain? It's really interesting. You know, one of the things that we're doing um, around that is a lot, of, a lot of students will come to me and ask me, uh, especially the first year students and those those that are sort of curious about consulting, if you will, you mm -hmm. know, before they get to business school, they've heard about it, but they heard we work really hard and they're not really sure because they want to have a family or they want to, you know, they like to have hobbies and, and other interests. They mm -hmm. sort of say, you know, how should I think about work-life balance? And you know what I tell the students almost consistently is um, work-life balance by definition implies that you have to have a life outside of work because work really sucks. <laughs> and, and, and sort of you're almost giving the high ground before you've even started the recruiting process of assuming that you're going to take a job that's going to suck the life out of you. And you're going into it worried about what you're going to do on your weekends to replenish. And my advice to students is you should start by looking for a job that doesn't suck. Well, you, know, you should look for I, a I'm, job. I'm going to challenge kind of, you on that one. I'm going to challenge okay. you a little bit on that one. Okay. okay. I can love my job. And still want to spend time with my family or have other mm -hmm. interests that I want to pursue. So I don't know, that that, very... you know, that, that would, that would, uh, I'm not sure that I, I, I agree with your assumption there. So let me give you, let me give you an alternative way. And this okay. is the way that we train, we train it at Bain. Okay. You know, the, what you're really, what people are really asking when they ask about work-life balance is they're asking, how can I do the job in a sustainable way? How can I, how can I be, thriving both professionally and personally while while working in such a demanding job that's really what they're after mm -hmm. okay and and the way we train it is we actually uh we did this uh several years ago probably about 10 years ago i did this at uh, one of our training programs and we sort of rolled it out to a lot of our other training programs draw two by two mm -hmm. and on the x-axis you know put put work and life but on the y-axis put drains energy and gives energy Mm -hmm. And what you'll see is that you can actually populate all four quadrants. And really what they're asking is, how can I do more of the stuff that I like doing and less of the stuff that I don't like doing over time? Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, there is uh, a couple of people in the office where we've worked together for, at this point, you know, one of my colleagues and I started together back in 96. You know, at the time, you know, our girlfriends and, I, and, 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 and the other, we went out as a couple. We went out to dinner. You know, mm -hmm. we, we go over each other's house. 
mm-hmm. you know, our families know each other. And so we might actually get, you know, my two sons and his three kids together with our wives and go out someplace. Is that work or life? I mean, those are work friends. Right. We're spending time with our families. You know, I have a, a couple of very serious hobbies. You know, I take a lot of pictures. I'm a photographer. Okay. So if I have a, you know, and I, I used to play soccer a lot. Um, I played in, you know, I did track in college and I, I played all the sports is always a very big part of what I do. If I play on the office soccer team and I'm playing on Saturday mornings, but on the way home, I'm offering some of our ACs who Ubered it to the field a ride back downtown and we start talking about their case and I'm giving them some advice and some mentoring. Is that work or is that life? Both. You know, I, I, I wanted to play soccer. It's, it's kind of both. Soccer. It's interesting. But but I I am a you know I really get energy from from developing people, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. actually the more important thing, right? It's it's not that I it's you know it's I'm now having a work conversation on my personal time. It's that I'm doing something that I like doing. Yeah. You know, and that that's really the split. But I think to draw an artificial split and say that you can't sort of blend the two and there has to be sort of opposite ends of the seesaw, I think that sets you up for sort of a constant friction. And what people should really be trying to do, especially early in their business school experience, is trying to find that job and and not just that job, but that company that allows them to sort of be a whole person and to find that way of doing the job in a sustainable way. And at the end of the day, you do have to make some trade-offs. And at different points in your life, not every career that you started is the career that you should stay in. But early on in your career, I encourage students sort of aim high. You know, aim high and look for that job that allows you to do both. Work for a company that values sort of you know, having a family and, and being a family friendly workplace, a, a, a job that values sort of sustainability in your career. You know, I mentioned our growth rate a little bit earlier. When you're growing as fast as we're growing, that means you need managers. And we don't tend to hire a ton of managers outside. We do hire some, but we tend to promote our managers from within. And if I have the type of workplace that just sort of burns people out in two exactly. years where they're running from the hills so they can get their life back, that becomes a business problem for me. Right. And the fact that we're the best place to work so frequently tells you that it's more than just me talking today. It's actually part of our strategy. It's helping people do the job in a sustainable way. So it's not to say those folks who think about work-life balance have it wrong, but it is to say that they're limiting the full potential of what they could get out of work when they think about it that way. I think if they think about it, and I I would agree with you, if they think about it as as being in conflict, then I would agree with you Mm -hmm. that that they are basically saying that that they're going to hate their job. But um, Mm -hmm. the fact that you were at the soccer game, you know, or that that you have friends from work, that that supports the concept, if you ask ask me, of of work-life balance. Yeah, but yeah, I, I always interpret that as students thinking that you know, they don't like to mix their work life and their and their personal life. Mm. And that's where I say, well, I don't know that that's always the right way to think about it. I actually have you know, fantastic friends at work who are willing to try things that, you know, they may not try, whether it's going to a concert or going to a show or trying some new sport. And it makes me willing to do the same. You know, mm. they, we know each other's kids. Um, you know, some of our alums, uh, when they've left, you know, we've gone on trips together and stayed with them, you know, with their families and, and things like that. And if, I think if I sort of set up that boundary that said I need to have a life totally separate from work, I think that leaves a lot of really great you know, friendships on the table. I um, think you're right. And I, I encourage people to think about it a little bit more holistically and be creative. No, I think, um, I think you're you making know, really good points. Might surprise you. I mean, I, I also think, you know, even though I, I raised the question, I asked, I used the phrase, I raised the question. I think there's a, mm-hmm. there's frequently a lot of lip service paid to work life balance. And, <laughs> yeah, there definitely is. Um, you know, we do um we do a bunch of different things around that to uh to help people sort of sort through it. And it's not to say we sort of put it all on them to figure it out as adults, but you know, we do uh, you know, upward feedback and and you know, case team surveys and worldwide employee surveys, you know, things like take two or flexible work options. And take two is, by the way, you, we have the option for our consulting staff to just basically take a two month sabbatical. Hmm. Um, you know, we do a lot of things to give people chances to recharge. You know, it's funny because I always laugh like I don't like yard work. So on the work life balance equation, that might be life, but I'd rather be at work. <laughs> you know, so, so I don't yeah. think that work work life always defaults to life being the good stuff. Right, um, right. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so it's, it's also important to keep that in mind, too. I'd rather be in a case team meeting. <laughs> OK. Right. Um, yeah, I can think of some life things that I'd rather not be doing. <laughs> I'd rather be at work. 
also, right? exactly. you know, straightening up the house, cleaning the garage goes, goes, that goes there. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. If, if I was not a U.S. citizen and I wanted to be a Bain consultant, would I have to be placed in my home country or could I work in you in the U S or could I work in other places in the world? That's a good question. And it, it's always uncertain. Um, you know, I haven't checked Twitter today, so I don't know if our policies have changed, but <laughs> what I would say is that um, if you're, if you're a top student, we're looking for talent everywhere in the world for all of our 55 offices. We're growing and need to find the best people that we can find. So when we're going through our process, um, in almost every case, it is sort of immigration status blind until the towards the end of the process. Okay. And what I mean by that is when we're at our best, um, and let's talk specifically about the question you asked about people who aren't U.S. citizens wanting to work in the U.S. because there's obviously a lot of variations around the world, but let's yeah. just focus on that one for a second. You know, when we're at our best. I would want to give Keith an offer and say, Keith, here's your offer to work in Chicago. We understand that you need a visa to work here. If you're not successful in the visa lottery, you will start work for Bain in this office where you are authorized to work. Mm -hmm. We're at our best because it's a very anxiety ridden process. And if I can take some of the anxiety out of it by just sort of saying, here's plan A, but we have thought about plan B because depending on the year, it's very possible we might need plan B. That's what we're trying to do. The other thing that we're trying to do is make sure that we don't have an office that's disproportionately at risk um, with the number of people they hired. So just make up a number. You know, if we hired 10 people, but seven of them need to get visas, you know, I can't afford to have four people show up when I planned on 10. So we do monitor it for that, but we're not screening at the sort of application stage or even the round one interview stage based on immigration status. Um, we do sort of want the best and the brightest people. And if they can't, get their authorization to work in the U.S. We do everything we can to support them, um, ideally working at Bain, but we do everything we can to support them uh, as they as they transition into the workforce. Okay. And I, I assume if they later wanted to try and transfer again to the U.S. and there was need in the U.S., Bain would do <clears throat> what it could within the legal, yeah. the legal structure. Absolutely. And there, there are visas that allow people to you know, transfer into company and things like that um, after a certain length of time. So we try and take advantage of those as well. But, you know, our first goal is to make sure that they're supported and that they feel like, you know, we're doing everything that we can to, to get them into Bain, which is the path that we both set out on and the, both the path that we both want. Um, and, and then, you know, from there, you know, hopefully things work out over time. And I would say, we, you know, we have a fantastic team here that stays on top of you know, all of those types of immigration issues and visa issues. And they really do an awesome job of supporting people who find themselves in need of an alternate starting look, starting place, or you know, maybe they started and their visa expired and they didn't get to renew it. But we have an awesome team here that helps sort of them land on their feet back in a country that, where they can work. Um, so they, you know, that, that part of it, you know, students shouldn't be anxious about. They should apply. Um, and let us, you know, let's get through the process and then worry about how all that stuff works out. Okay. How do you see consulting changing in the next five to 10 years? Um, do you see consultant roles changing, needed characteristics or skills changing? You know, that's a good question. I, I thought about, like, I, I try and think about how I would answer that, how I would have answered that, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago <laughs> when I started. You know, I think yeah. what's different, what's been different and getting, you know, continuing along this path is that when I started, it was, there was a premium on finding the information. If you were the one that found the information, sort of, you were the only one with the information. Now, you know, my younger son is 14. He's got a, he's got a phone where he can look up pretty much anything he wants to know anytime, anywhere in the world. So it's finding the information no longer makes you, right, it, it no longer makes you special, just finding the information. The, the, what makes you special now is the discernment that you have when you're looking at that information and trying to figure out which of the 25,000 results Google returned in under a second has the right information and how the top three sources that say something slightly different, how can you reconcile them? So I think that discernment skill is going to get more important you know, for consulting over time. The tools that consultants are using are evolving very rapidly now. You know, it, it, back when I started, it was a lot of Excel. Um, it was uh, it, it was a lot of Excel. It was a lot of PowerPoint. Now there's sort of and, and maybe some SPSS. You know, now that's sort of 
that sort of table stakes. You know, that's what, that's what it takes to just be in the room. Mm-hmm. You know, and now there's a lot more sophisticated data, data analytics tools that are being used. The availability of data yeah. is different. You know, you, and and I think that's only going to get greater as time goes on. And then I I do think that probably the biggest change uh, that we'll see is just the the multidisciplinary nature of the expertise that's in the room is going to change. You know, I think about the work that we're doing with digital, um, the work that we're doing with advanced analytics, agile innovation, um, all of those types of things. There are sort of experts in the room today that are experts in areas that frankly didn't exist a couple of years ago. <laughs> and so I think there's, I think that's only going to proliferate. You know, I think that design thinking and some of the things that people are doing out there today in that area, machine learning, you know, there's going to be people um, on case teams. There's going to be people coming out of MBA programs who have sort of a, a wider range of expertise than than we've seen in the past. And I think that's only going to get, you know, it's only becoming more and more common in the future. And so it, it, you asked about consultants. I think it'll be interesting, you know, if you're a manager sort of five or 10 years from now, so the consultants that are starting today, you know, they're going to be managing teams that look very different than the teams they were on when they were first year consultants right out of business school. You know, they'll have a couple of MBAs, a couple of undergrads, but then they might have that master of science and analytics person. They may have that person who's an app developer or, or, or a digital, you know, a, a, a digital designer um, on their team, adding value in ways that are different because they just think differently. They were trained differently um, and they bring a very different expertise. And I think that's really exciting. I think that's going to be very interesting um, to yeah. watch as it unfolds. You know, um, as you were as you were talking, and I, I mentioned to you that Accepted put up its first website in 1996. And of course, at, this, at the time, just providing information that was readily available was d- d- right. differentiating. Right. And of course, today, there's, you know, like you said, you can you'll get 25,000 responses in a second on your, on your smartphone that's in your pocket or purse. So that, um, yeah, that's been a dramatic change. And what you see. Different day. Yeah. It was fascinating what you, what, you know, how you see things developing. Now the question more about your personal background, you got your Mm -hmm. BS and your MS in engineering from MIT and then went to work at Bain. You also decided to earn an MBA from Harvard business school. How did you benefit from your HBS experience, given the outstanding education you had already, the credentials, and the work experience you had from Bain when, when you arrived at Harvard? I mean, was it, was it something that you had to do because Bain required it for you to move up in the company, in the firm? Or was it something that you, you wanted to do and benefited from? Yeah, so... The way the way it works at Bain and Company is you don't have to go back to get your MBA. I actually um, did four years, so I did our our AC program, uh, which is three years. So I was an associate consultant for two years and a senior associate consultant for a year. So that's the three year AC program. But I actually did four years. I was promoted to consultant before going back to business school, so I was sort of already across the threshold, if you will, mm-hmm. without my MBA. Mm-hmm. Um, I joined Bain because I knew I wanted to go back to business school. So even though I did that fourth year and sort of had proven that I could perform at the MBA level without my MBA, it was still a personal goal of mine to go back. So I did choose to go back, Um, but I was not, I didn't have to go back. We have several managers and partners just in our Chicago office alone that don't have their MBA Um, and firm wide, you know, that's, that's certainly fairly common. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go back to your MBA. Um, In my case, I said it was a personal goal. And I would say what I took away from it was just a much broader perspective on business. Um, You know, subject matter wise, I had, after four years at Bain, I had seen so many different industries, work with so many different senior leadership teams all over the world that there wasn't a lot of things that I saw in business school that were brand new to me. But there were several areas that I was not as deep as the person who had been working in retail for several years or somebody who had been a banker for several years or an entrepreneur. I would say that I was proficient in pretty much everything we worked on, especially supply chain, which is where I spent a lot of my time. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't say that I was sort of an expert at, at all of the areas I saw at business school. So it rounded out my skill set. But what I really thought was most valuable was the personal growth that I got from being there. And that was from hearing the experiences of my classmates and really getting to know my section mates and, and you know, getting, getting a perspective on leadership from another consultant is one thing, but to have somebody who 
you know, led a Navy SEAL team talk about leadership is just a very different perspective and not one that I had seen prior to that. You know, talking about what it's like to grow a company and what it means to sort of prepare it for sale or or to to divest a business is something I had looked at and talked about at Bain. I had done M&A work. But to sit in section with a very good friend of mine who had built and sold three companies before HBS was a very different perspective on that. Um, Thinking about not just the diversity of backgrounds for the people, but how they thought about solving problems and, and getting exposure to the industries they worked in, that personal growth and that perspective in a way that was more than just sort of hearing it in passing or working on it one client at a time, just getting immersed in it every day was tremendously important to me. And then what we talked about earlier around sustainability or or using the term work-life balance, Mm -hmm. um, it was also very important for me to take business school as a chance to to spend more time sort of as a husband. Mm -hmm. Uh, My wife also had her master's degree uh, in engineering and uh, had a pretty demanding job as well. And so it was really great for us to sort of have some time um, as a couple at HBS. We have our 20th anniversary next month Mm -hmm. and um, we started our family at HBS. Um, mm-hmm. you know, my son was born in Boston, um, and HBS was a great time, not just for, for my personal growth in terms of my business skill set, but it was a great chance for me to sort of reflect on what I was trying to get out of my career and what success would look like more holistically. Um, and I wouldn't have traded that experience in the two years to do that for anything. Okay, great. Thank you for the answer. It was wonderful. Keith, I also want to thank you so much for joining me today. I I think I've really abused your your generosity in terms of your time. Where can listeners and potential Bain consultants learn more about becoming a consultant at Bain & Company? Yeah, so we try and put a lot of information out on our website. uh, Bain.com slash careers uh, is where they can go, and that's where they can find out about our Experience Bain uh, live events, our Experience Bain web events. They can also check for what Bain is doing on their campuses. Um, and we try and list everything that we're doing around the world on that website. Uh, we're also uh, pretty active. I talk a lot about our culture and how supportive we are and some of the cool things our people are doing. We also um, are showcasing that um, on our Instagram feed. So just look for Bain and Company on Instagram. And we try and keep it a little bit light uh, and just give people a sense of the types of people that work here and the types of things that are going on in the different offices around the system. Um, and of course, Bain.com, uh, you can go and read a little bit about the work that we're doing, uh, see what we're doing in our practice areas, either on the website or using the Bain Insights app. Um, so you can download some of the some of the intellectual property that we've been publishing and see some of the cool things that we're working on, especially nowadays with digital and adapt and agile innovation and the Bain Innovation Exchange, so on and so forth. Uh, lots of really great stuff for students to learn about Bain out there. Okay, great. Keith, I want to thank you again, and we'll include links in the show notes at accept.com slash 251 to the sites that Keith just mentioned, as well as to related articles. Check it all out. They're all linked to at accept.com slash 251. Listener, thank you too for joining Keith Bevins and me for our 251st episode. If you found this show worthwhile, please make sure you don't miss any others. Subscribe through your favorite podcatcher. We have subscribe links in the show notes at accept.com slash 251. Thanks again for coming. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. Our theme music is provided by podcastthemes.com, 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 podcastthemes.com. Podcast